What I'd like to do is start by explaining terminology, and uh, the simplest way of doing that is um, by distinguishing three very different views of globalization. So the first is a quote from an academic who actually taught me at the Harvard Business School uh, about 35 years ago. The second is from a famous manager. And the third is from a famous journalist. And in the spirit of getting you know, blood circulation going, et cetera, as well as get my getting a pulse of this audience, I realize that none of these views of globalization probably exactly captures how you think about the phenomenon. But I am curious if we were to uh, implement, say, a Venezuela-style voting scheme where you are obliged to vote in favor of one of the alternatives, which one you would pick as coming closest to your perspective on globalization. How many would go for the first alternative? Okay, so uh, a few people in the front rows, but otherwise very few other people. Second alternative, a few more people. Third alternative. Okay, so it's actually, it seems like uh, there's roughly even support for the second and the third alternative. The first alternative is comparatively neglected. So the first quote, which is the notion of a world in which borders, national borders are so impermeable that very little crosses them and we can basically take a national perspective on the world. That's what I think of as world 1.0. The last of these viewpoints, what I call world 2.0, the diametrical opposite of world 1.0, in which national borders are so permeable that lots of stuff basically zips back and forth across them as if the borders didn't matter. What I'd like to suggest, and which at least a certain number of you agreed with, is that neither World 1.0 nor World 2.0 really are very reflective of the world that we live in, nor are they very useful as a basis for policy discussions. And so what I'm going to spend a little bit of time, just as a motivational exercise, because clearly we do have significant differences of opinion even within this room about where globalization is at, is just trying to explain why I think World 3.0 is both a more realistic and more useful way of thinking about the world at large before I drill down to the level of the EU and to the Netherlands position within the EU. There is this robust tendency towards overestimation of exactly how global we are, so robust that I've given it the value-free name Globaloni. What's truly striking to me is the amount of Globaloni that persists despite what we've seen happening after the global financial crisis. So the world, in terms of breadth and in terms of depth, is not quite as globalized as it was before the global financial crisis, even though five, six years have now elapsed. So whenever I see opinions that are so much at variance with the facts, it's interesting to speculate at least what the reasons for the divergence might be. And so let me just list some hypotheses about why intuitions about globalization are so skewed, and you can apply this global only detector kit to yourself as well. First of all, globalization is supposed to be something that we know so much about from our personal experience that we often don't feel a need to either start with or return to the data. Second reason for global only, projection bias. Third, uh, you know, not an original thought, this is due to Jean de La Fontaine, who wrote fables, people believe what they want most or what they fear most. Fourth, social pressure. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, they're what I call techno-trances. And a uh, term I invented, but reflecting the phenomenon, and I noticed that most of this audience, this is unfortunately increasingly true these days, is significantly younger than me. So you probably know something personally about this, about this physiological fact that if you listen to techno music for long periods of time, 
it does stuff to brainwave activity. Something similar seems to happen with exaggerated discussions of technology in the globalization context. So if you really believe that technology trumps everything else, then it's much easier to sell yourself a vision of a world in which borders don't matter. So why does global only matter? Well, if we lived in world 2.0, again, and I detected slightly more hands for world 2.0 than my preferred alternative, world 3.0, we could conclude this whole discussion right now. If the world really were perfectly integrated, the EU would be irrelevant, the Netherlands' position vis-a-vis -vis the EU would be irrelevant, and there really wouldn't be any interesting room for any kind of policy discussion. What I'm going to argue in the rest of my talk is similar kinds of beliefs not only exist at the European and at the Dutch level, but also have similar consequences. Not only are they unrepresentative of the data, but they, in effect, preclude the ability to have any useful policy debates. So if the EU were perfectly integrated, there'd be nothing more to be gained. Maybe we might want to prevent backsliding. There'd be nothing more to be gained from additional European integration. And if the Netherlands were perfectly integrated with the rest of the world, well, again, we might want to preserve that. But there'd be no new horizons to explore, no new markets to think about. And so now, let's go firmly from the very global level at which I started out to the EU level and then down to the uh, Dutch level. So are there actually people within Europe who really believe that the European Union is perfectly integrated or close to it? Well, there are some. So I've summarized a couple of major pieces of work in just two slides. So let me just recap the conclusions. On the one hand, we, ha we do have evidence that EU membership significantly boosts trade with other EU members. Uh, the other point, though, is that while EU, members, uh, EU membership does have its benefits, to treat EU members as already perfectly integrated with each other, given the previous slide that I put up, is probably not a very good idea. But what this starts to suggest to me is that part of the problem is that while we have had more and more Europe, it hasn't been balanced integration. People have focused on a subset of the administrative barriers and reducing those administrative barriers, but the people in Brussels haven't really, in particular, paid enough attention to the cultural differences and some of the other differences that still divide Europe. So what I'd like to suggest is that one of the critical implications for the EU, but this is the part that I'm going to whiz across, is a somewhat broader notion of integration than one that focuses just on a subset of administrative measures. In particular, integration that balances across the different components rather than simply assuming that directives focused on certain kinds of administrative barriers are going to be adequate to the task. So I think in principle, everybody recognizes that there has to be some rethinking of what the EU does and what it doesn't do, so that instead of the debate about more or less Europe, we have a debate about a more focused Europe or a more focused European Commission. And what I'd like to suggest is the little framework of cultural differences, administrative differences, geographic differences, and economic differences within the EU starts to suggest a little bit of an agenda. So what I'd like to move on to is, in my experience of globalization, people's concerns about it are almost invariably local. So rather than talking about just the EU, let's first start by looking at where the Netherlands is in terms of level of globalization. And then let me end with some possibly controversial suggestions about what, at least to me, are the clear implications for how the Netherlands should be thinking about what needs to happen with the EU and the role that the Netherlands should be playing in that particular process. So 
The good news is the Netherlands actually on the globalization index, and this is partly why I spent some time introducing it up front in my talk, actually does pretty well. What's the bad news if the Netherlands is still number one? Yes, the Netherlands is still number one. However, it's number one by a smaller margin than before. The ranking is good. The direction of change is not. So now I want to uh, turn to what's really fun after all this setup, thinking a little bit about what might this mean for what the Netherlands wants out of the EU and the direction in which the Netherlands might want to try and steer the European Union. And on the horizontal axis, question is, do we go for less globalization or more? And then the vertical axis has to do with how much distance should the Netherlands try and traverse. So the options are, this is the nativistic option, saying, OK, we've tried integrating with the world. It just brings us problems. Let's pull back, build walls or dikes around ourselves and make sure that you know, we aren't further affected by this unreliable turbulence of the global economy. With this audience, I'm not sure that I need to spend a lot of time on why this is not a particularly interesting option. What I actually want to talk about are three different options for trying to exploit some of this apparent headroom that we see for Dutch econ international economic relations. So, the farthest out option is a notion that, and this is one that captures a lot of attention these days, we know that the locus of world growth is shifting away from Europe. The EU's share of world GDP has dropped for the last two decades, if I remember the numbers correctly, and has continued to project to drop. And the big growth is going to be in, in China and to a lesser extent India's share of world GDP. So this might be called the stretch option. An intermediate option is, well, you know, those emerging markets are really far away, but the Netherlands really has strong cultural affinities with, you know, Anglo-America, with Britain in particular, and also to some extent the US. So especially as Britain thinks about metaphorically sailing westward across the Atlantic, maybe the Netherlands needs to think as well about refocusing its efforts away from the EU. And the third is the much more conventional and to many people more boring option, saying, well, despite the problems with the EU, let's continue to focus on the EU. And then there is another peculiarly, particularly Dutch reason for thinking about the EU. The Netherlands is one of the privileged gateways for people, whether they're uh, transferring merchandise or whether they're foreign direct investment, for accessing the EU. And while the value added isn't quite as much, say, on re-exports as it is on domestic trade, this is a very, very privileged position indeed. And so there's an asymmetry between the strength of the argument one can make about the general benefits of the EU to all its members and the particular benefits that accrue to the gatekeeper into the EU, which is another reason why I would regard a strategy of turning one's back on the EU to focus on markets further afield, whether in the North Atlantic or let alone in emerging markets, as even more wrong-headed for the Netherlands than they would be for the typical EU country that doesn't have this kind of gatekeeping function to protect, preserve, and presumably enhance if it can. So this is not me calling on the Dutch to be more European-minded. This is me appealing to Dutch self-interest in terms of relations with the EU. If the EU adds value, proportionately speaking, this gatekeeper role suggests that it adds more value for the Netherlands than it does for the typical EU member, which is another reason why thinking of what could be done to strengthen this union, or at least preserve it, 
strikes me as a very important part of the national agenda. Here you are, members of the world's most integrated region with a privileged gatekeeping role, and yet there's a serious debate within this country about whether to withdraw from it. It can't hurt and might help to inject a few more facts into the debate about exactly what the current level of integration is. One has to pick one's battles and one has to decide what's possible. And so we do have to be somewhat deliberate in how we proceed in this direction. Not all things are going to be feasible right away, but having some sense of what the objectives are and some sense of what we can do now and we, what we must do later would be critical to creating the degrees of freedom that are actually needed for policymakers to do what all the previous slides in this presentation talked about.